Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon and greetings from University Tunku Abdul Rahman, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Thank you for the invitation to deliver a lecture on the topic of Malaysian architecture to students studying in your prestigious university, lovely professional university. This is made possible via the MOU signed between UTA and LPU recently. I would personally like to thank Dr. Shista Mansur from the Division of International Affairs of LPU and looking forward to get to know more students and teaching staff of LPU. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Abdul Muluk bin Abdul Manan. I'm a specialist teaching ASEAN Architecture Course Coordinator, Department of Architecture and Sustainable Design, Li Kongqian Faculty of Engineering and Science, University Tunku Abdul Rahman. I am an architect by profession and currently teaching Architecture Studio Final Year, Bachelor of Science Honours in Architecture. I am also the convener for the upcoming International Students Colloquium, which will be held in Utah Kampa and the city campus from 23rd to 29th of October 2023. As an MOU Partners University, all of you will be invited to join. More info about the colloquium will be shared with you soon. Let us start the lecture now. This lecture attempts to portray the classification of Malaysian architecture according to the trends and changes along with the advancement of the economy, technology and growth of Malaysia throughout the nation's history. Today's Malaysian architecture is a synthesis of architectural languages in which Western and Eastern ideas ranging from the traditional neoclassical to the international style and postmodernism have a strong influence. The phases of Malaysian architecture are very much influenced by its geographical location. Malaysia is blessed with natural beauty and resources that enable it to be independent and the hot, wet equatorial climate of Malaysia and its high humidity together with the abundance of timber and other building materials enable builders and architects alike to experiment with the built form. Let us look at the overview of Malaysia. Malaysia is a country in Southeast Asia the federal constitutional monarchy consists of 13 states and three federal territories separated by the South China Sea into two regions, Peninsular Malaysia and Borneo East Malaysia. Before colonialism, there were no Southeast Asian countries like today. The Malay Archipelago region was a fluid, borderless Nusantara where people, goods and ideas move freely. The region was a major crossroads for sea traders between East, Greater China and West, Indian subcontinent. And this is an important factor in Malaysia's history and architectural development. Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1824 divided the region into two, which subsequently become two different nations, Indonesia and Malaysia. During World War II, British Malaya, along with other nearby British and American colonies, was occupied by the Empire of Japan. Following the three years of occupation, Peninsular Malaysia was unified as the Federation of Malaya in 1948. The country achieved independence on 31st of August 1957. The independent Malaya united with the British Crown colonies of North Borneo, Sarawak and Singapore on 16 September 1963 to become Malaysia. In August 1965, Singapore was expelled from the Federation and become a separate independent country. Let us look at the history. Evidence of 
modern human habitation in Malaysia dates back 40,000 years. The prehistoric human sites near Bukit Lawin, oldest more than 100 years, Kota Tampan 75,000 years, Bukit Jawa 50 to 100,000 years, Bukit Buno 40,000 years, Gua Teluk Kelawar Bones 8,000 years, and Bukit Kepala Gajah. The site has an undisturbed stone tool production area created using equipment such as anvil and hammer stones. The Tambun Rock Art is also situated in Perak. The earliest anatomically modern human skeleton in Peninsular Malaysia, the Perak Men, dates back 11,000 years and Perak Women dating back 8,000 years were both discovered in Langong on upper part of Peninsular Malaysia. Sarawak Nia Caves, there is evidence of the oldest human remains in Malaysia dating back 40,000 years. Archaeologists have claimed a much earlier date for stone tools found in the Mansuli Valley near Lahad Datu in Sabah, but precise dating analysis has not been published. Dr. Siti Zuraina Abdul Majid was the archaeologist who, in 1991, discovered the 74,000-year-old Paleolithic stone tool site in Lenggong, Perak, alongside the Perak Man, which is the oldest human skeleton discovered in Malaysia. Archaeologists have found remains, possibly belonging to the old Kedah Kingdom, among these ruins are the remains of stone building and what may be a boat. Remains from the smelting of iron, including a large clay furnace, have also been found. Archaeological sites in Sungai Batu show evidence of a flourishing industry in iron ore smelting and trade at the time. The current date of the Sungai Batu ancient civilization predates the founding of ancient Rome, making it one of the oldest civilization in Southeast Asia. The discovery earned this site to be declared UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2012. And you can see the world civilization timeline here, where 788 BC, where Sungai Batu ancient civilization started. The Kingdom of Langkasuka arose around the 2nd century in the northern area of Peninsular Malaysia, lasting until about the 15th century. Between the 7th and 13th century, much of the southern Malay Peninsula was part of the maritime Sri Vijayan Empire. By the 13th and 14th century, the Majapahit Empire had successfully wrested control over more of the peninsula and the Malay archipelago from Sri Vijaya. Early 15th century, Paramiswala, a runaway king of the former kingdom of Singapore, linked to the old Sriwijayan court, founded the Malacca Sultanate. The spread of Islam increased following Paramiswara conversion to the religion. Malacca was an important commercial center during this time, attracting trade from around the region. The evidence of Chandi around south of Kedah between Mount Jerai and the Muda Valley, a sprawling historical complex known as Bujang Valley, serve as a reminder of a Malaysian pre-Islamic art. Within an area of about 350 square kilometers, 87 early historic religious sites have been reported and there are 12 chandis located on mountain tops, a feature we suggest may derive from the pre-Islamic Malay belief regarding the sanctity of high places. And early references to Malaysian architecture can be found in several old Chinese records. The 7th century Chinese account tells of Buddhist pilgrims calling at Langkasuka and mention the city as being surrounded by a wall on which towers had been built and was approached through double gates. Another 7th century account of a special Chinese envoy recorded that the capital city had three gates more than a hundred paces apart which were decorated with paintings of Buddhist themes and female spirits.
The identification of architectural style. Malaysia has inherited an eclectic range of architecture from its rich historical past. From one of the oldest European architectural remains in Asia, the site of the A. Famosa Fort in Malacca, to the tallest twin towers in the world, the Petronas Twin Towers, this structure shows just how far Malaysia has come. The seventh category of architectural slide, vernacular ethnic indigenous orang asal, traditional Malay vernacular, straight eclectic, colonial and neoclassical, art deco, modern and postmodern. Several design elements of traditional Malaysian architecture are adapted to modern structure to reflect the Malaysian identity. Wood, an important factor in traditional Malay buildings, is also reinterpreted, readapted in the modern landscape in the Kuala Lumpur International Airport and Putrajaya, for example. From a simple link to shelter to sophisticated architecture of palaces suitable for tropical climate. The Malay traditional houses are elevated dwelling spaces built with organic material. This example of vernacular architecture are prone to ravages of climate and many have not survived the centuries. Conservation efforts are being undertaken to preserve some fine example of built structures which stand testimony to the architectural mastery and artistry of the people of the Malay world. The layout of the traditional Malay houses is seemingly random and gives a non-uniform look, but the wisdom behind Malay architecture surprises the uninitiated. The well-thought-out design, use of natural resources, and the overall functionality represents the identity of a people who have lived in harmony with nature since ancient times. They are customarily owner or community built, utilizing traditional technologies from one generation to the next. The rural settlement have grown into geographically distinctive locations that vary from hilltops, valley, riverbanks, lowlands, estuaries, and coastal area, with each area developing different types of economy social organization and built environment. The finest example, the Sultan Mansur Shah of Malacca Palace, built in 1465. It was raised on 17 base structures on wooden pillars with seven tiered roof in copper shingles and with gilded spires and Chinese grass mirror. The first detailed description of Malay architecture was on the great wooden palace of Mansur Shah, who reigned between 1458 to 1477. As gleaned from the Sejarah Melayu or Malay Annals, the Malay rulers were very particular patrons of the arts. While checking on the workmanship of his new palace, Sultan Mansur Shah expressed his displeasure because one of the crossbeam was undersized and the colors are too dark. So, a new crossbeam was immediately procured to replace it. The description in the building, the description of the building in the annals are remarkably lucid considering its age and circumstances. A replica of the palace was built not far from the site, but it is far from the original palace would be. This was due to the original palace demolished by the Portuguese in 1511 when they captured Malacca. Only a few of these palaces survived. Istana Sri Menanti in Negeri Sembilan and Istana Kenangan in Kuala Kangsa Perak is two of these examples. Istana Lama Sri Penanti, an elegant five-story timber palace, was built in the 20th century by expert Malay craftsmen and carvers. Designed by two skillful local master builders, no piece of iron 
nail or metal screw was used. It is recognized as the tallest wooden palace in Southeast Asia. Istana Kenangan was once the royal residence but now the Royal Museum of Perak. This two-story building was built in 1925 without a single nail. Its facade is beautiful in its state color of yellow, white, and black. The element of Malay architecture, the steel long window for ventilation, multiple roof ridges, and calf overhang are plainly evident. The palace had been the official residence between 1931 and 1933. Istana Kenangan is noted of being entirely built using wood without the use of nail. It was planned to shape like a sword. In its scabbard, the handle of the sword is where the Sultan's bed chamber is located. The scabbard is where the royal court of Balai Rungseri was located. Although small, it has a beautiful throne or singasana. The walls are made of diamond-shaped plate or kalari, while the roof structure takes the combined style of five ridges parabung lima and the ridge of the five bananas. The traditional timber Malay houses or rumah kayu, an intelligent building for its time. Raised on steel, the post and lintel structure with wooden or bamboo walls topped by sloping roof or thatched with gable on both sides. The typical Malay houses are a fine example of sophisticated rural domestic architecture. Still ensure minimal impact on the ground, the earth space they respect to avoid human-animal conflict. The raised dwelling is also safeguard from flood. Height of steel of hard durable wood such as chengal vary according to location, inland or coastal. Being in the tropics with generally high daily temperatures, the earth floor space allows temperature regulation, ventilation and unimpeded air circulation. Figure six, uh, 7 show basic construction method. The Malay house construction start by placing the first column known as Tiang Seri located in the middle of the house. Meanwhile, other structural components such as posts and girts are laid in their respective positions. After all, the posts and girts have been erected and braced. Top girts and king posts are then set up on both sides. Following that, the roof ridge supported by the king post is placed and subsequently the roof structure such as the principal rafter, purlins and common rafters are put up. Finally, the non-structural components are placed to make the house an enclosure structure. It can be observed here that the house is of modular construction. As the family expands, Additional units are added on. Every region has its own style and this is most prominent in the style of the tropically suited roof, the long rich roof with slope for humble dwellings. Wealthier families have the five rich roof, calf panels below the roof edge, cut glare during the day while the adorn and add a touch of finesse to the home. Another interesting feature of the traditional Malay house is the tongue and groove construction method which doesn't use nails or joints that can be damaged the timber and allows the building to be dismantled and reconstructed in different locations. If you need to remove any parts that is damaged or even move the whole house, you can. That is how flexible the system of construction is. This draw the attention to the Malay contribution to the technology of architecture. The Malay were among the pioneers in the art of modular construction and prefabrication long before this idea resurfaced in architectural journals. The traditional Malay houses have their own form of geomancy. 
The Tiang Seri, a freestanding pillar without any joints, is the main pillar of the house and is the main section. A defining characteristic of the Malay house is its construction without nails or metal support. Builders, artisans are adept in the art of cutting wood in such a manner that pieces slide together and solidly interlock. Interlocking edges and ends of wood are tightened by wedges. Such a construction can withstand earthquakes. Another advantage is that it can be easily dismantled and rebuilt in another location. This is one of the examples of a Malay traditional house at its finest. There are many details here and you can see that it is intricately carved and the tiles are very ornament, ornamental. The non-structural components are windows and panels for the floors, wall, stairs and roofs fitted between the frames. Window components can be divided into three operable sections, the top, middle and bottom. The top section, called ornamentation, is a fixed ventilation panel that is usually well decorated and carved. The floor is one of the non structural components in traditional Malay house. It is nailed on the floor joist and it is also common to leave gaps between the plank to facilitate activities of cleaning, sweeping and washing, or for religious need. Different parts of the building was built by different craftsmen. This Malay house in Malimau, Malacca, was built in 1898. The traditional house, Malay house are built using single timber frame structure. They have pitch roof, porches in the front, high ceilings, many openings on the walls for ventilations and are often embellished with elaborate wood carvings. The beauty and quality of Malay wood carvings were meant to serve as visual indicators of the social rank and status of the owner themselves. The shapes and sizes of the houses differ from state to state. Common elements in peninsular Malaysia include pitch roofs, verandas and high ceilings raised on steel for ventilation. The woodwork in the house is often intricately carved. The floor are the different levels depending on the functions of the room. Today, the traditional house is more commonly found in rural parts of the country. However, one can still get a glimpse of Kampung living in the heart of metropolitan Kuala Lumpur in, the, uh, in Kampung Baru. In those days, there are no architects. It's just tukang or uh, experts. Eh? Uh, the Rumah Panjang of Sarawak and Sabah is a unique and community-oriented lifestyle and it's a free flow culture lifestyle with greens and few obstructions. This is the example of the Roma Panja. Many indigenous people of Borneo, the Daya and Kadazan Dusun live in buildings known as long houses. Commonly, the long houses are built raised off the ground on steel similar to the Malay house, but are divided into a more or less public area along one side and a row of private living quarters lying along the other side. The entire architecture is designed and built as a standing tree with branches to the right and left with the front part facing the sunrise while the back part facing the sunset. The longhouse built act as a normal accommodation and a house of worship for religious activities. In some part of Sabah and Labuan, a substantial number of indigenous people like the Bajau and Brunayan Malay remain to live in Malay villages, in water villages. These water villages are also built on steel with houses connected with planks and motor transport by traditional boats. Foreign Multicultural Influences Chinese Architecture can be divided 
into two types, the traditional and Baba Nyonya. Baba Nyonya households are made of colorful tiles and have large indoor courtyards. Chinese influence can be seen in brightly decorated temples and terrace shop houses. The Indian. Uh, in this case, when we explain about the Indian, it includes all the countries in the subcontinent, include Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. The Indian subcontinent architecture came with the Malaysian Indians, reflecting the architecture of southern India where most originated from. Some Sikh architecture from Punjab was also found on Gurdwara buildings. Islamic architecture influence come with the religion in the 10th to 11th century AD. Oldest mosque in Malaysia is the 16th century mosque, the Masjid Kampung Laut in Kelantan. Regional architecture, Thai and Javanese. Throughout many decades, the migration of Achenese, Minangkabau, Javanese, Banjaris, Buginese, and the Thai regional Malay architectural style with influences from other parts of the archipelago also exist, especially in places where they form the majority. Western architecture, Portuguese and Dutch occupation over 300 years in Malacca introduced previously rare foreign building types such as forts, castles and churches, but not so much enduring influence from their architectural style. Chinese influence Chinese architecture can be divided into two types, the traditional and the Baba Nyonya. Uh, Chinese uh, influence can also be seen here in the brightly decorated temples and terrace shop houses. These are the temples and these are the shop houses. Taoist, Buddhist and other Chinese related temples and Kongsi. Kongsi is like a clubhouse eh? and Baba Nyonya mix. The Masjid Kampung Kling, built in 1748, is one of the earliest mosques in Malaysia. The mosque is found on Malacca Jalan Hang Lekiu, both filled with Chinese shop houses. It can be observed that the minaret is similar to the Chinese pagoda. The Al Mutakim Chinese mosque is designed with a unique Chinese architecture with pagoda and Chinese calligraphy from a combination of architectural design of several mosques in Beijing. Shanghai and Ji'an in China. It was developed by the Malacca Chinese Muslim Association. The evidence of the Chandi or pantheons around South Kedah between the Mount Jerai and the Muda Valley, sprawling historical complex known as Bujang Valley, serve as the reminder of Hindu Indian art within an area of about 350 square kilometers. And the influence can be seen on the gopuros of the temples. The Dravidian style is a typical of South Indian style temple that is usually made from stone. The temple shape may be rectangular square star shape or octagonal. These temples usually have gopurams, which are large towers over the entrance, a vimana, which is the tower over the sanctum, and large pillared hall and corridor. And here is an example of the Sikh Gurdwara. Islamic influence. Individual Arab traders, including Sahabas, preached in the Malay archipelago, India, Indochina, and China in the early 7th century. Islam was introduced to the Malay Peninsula coast by Arabs in 674 CE. Islam was also brought to Malaysia by Arab Muslim and Tamil Indian Muslim traders in the 12th century AD. Masjid Kampung Laut is estimated to have been built in the 15th century by a group of Champa government transporters from the kingdom of Champa. It is styled largely of 
typical local traditional architecture and is climate appropriate, similar to local houses in the area. The original mosque has basic architectural style and structure with four pillars for the foundation and, and palm fronts for the roof. It is said that the mosque was original Masjid Agung Demak that was built in 1401. Built in 1912, Zahir Mosque is one of the oldest mosques in Malaysia, located in Alusta, Kedah. Uh, this fascinating architectural heritage is one of the state's icon. And more recently, the Sultan Salahuddin Mosque in Shah Alam and the KL Tower used Islamic Mukarnas pattern as part of its design. The Putrajaya Islamic Complex was completed in 2016 in Putrajaya, the building which is motivated by modern Islamic architecture. This complex houses religious agencies under the portfolio of Religious Affairs Prime Minister's Department. Block A, C and D are connected by a bridge that is on the second floor in each block. The building also has an underground auditorium that can accommodate about 800 people. Putrajaya Islamic Complex features Islamic architecture that has its own aesthetic, value, progressive and using the latest technology. The arch on the roof shows the beauty of geometry features curved shaped like roof weaving. The unique facade of the Putrajaya Islamic Complex building is motivated by Islamic trellises. Forming a lace, braiding provides natural lighting and reduced glare. This building has the concept of light, transparency and dynamics. Inspired by the parable of Noor, which is light, as stated in Surah An-Nur verse 35. The main canopy with a design like a semi-structured steel dome subtly gives an interpretation of the decorative Islamic ornaments of Bukarnas. Regional influence. The Siamese culture can be seen strongly affecting its place of worship called Wat. However, this worship place can be identified only on the northern part of Peninsular Malaysia in the state of Kelantan, Kedah, and Perlis. The Siamese culture identify that the Siamese cultural identity that contributes to the rebuilding of place of Wat Machimaram associated with Buddhism. Siamese Buddhists are very faithful towards Wat, hence older generation will advise the younger generation to conserve Wat architecture uh, and its design. These are some examples of the uh, Thai Buddhist temples uh, located in the northern states in Peninsula Malaysia. Throughout many decades, the traditional Malaysian architecture has been influenced by the migration of Achinese, Minangkabau, Javanese, Banjaris, and Buginis, regional Malay architectural style with influence from other parts of the archipelago also exists especially in places where they form the majority. These are an example of buildings which can be found in Negeri Sembilan, a state where uh, strong Minangkabau influence can be observed. Western influences. In 1511, Malacca was conquered by Portuguese after which it was taken by the Dutch in 1641 and in 1786, the British Empire established a presence in Malaya when the Sultan of Kedah leased Penang Island to the British East India Company. The British obtained the town of Singapore in 1819 and in 1824 took control of Malacca following the Anglo-Dutch Treaty. By 1826, the British directly controlled Penang, Malacca, Singapore and the island of Laguan, which they established the crown colony of the Straits Settlement.
Some of the oldest surviving shop houses in the country can be found in the historical city of Malacca, which became an important port in the 15th century. An example is the number 8 Herring Street, a two-story shop house believed to have been built in the 1700s. According to the Baran Warisan Malaysia, early shop houses commonly served as a shop, residence, stable and animal yard at the same time. Subsequently, British rule in Malaya from 1824 to 1957 left us with a, quite a few examples of colonial architecture from that period. The Sultan Abdul Samad Building, the National Textile Museum, the former High Court, Kuala Lumpur Railway Station, and KL City Theatre and the Jamek Mosque, among others, showcase what is described as Moorish or Indo-Saracenic or Mughal architecture. British colonial period building with administrative edifices, colonial planters bungalow. Most of the Malaysian colonial buildings were built towards the end of the 19th and early 20th century. These buildings have Mughal, Tudor revival, Gothic revival, and straight eclectic style of architecture. Most of the style has been modified to cater uh, to the use of local resources and acclimatized to the local Malaysian climate which is hot and humid all year round. During the British era, any changes in architectural influences in the UK also influenced the colonial architecture in the then Malaya. The inherited buildings that include Kakosa Srinagara in Neo-Gothic and Tudor Revivalist architecture, Royal Slango Club in Mock Tudor styling, and St. Mary's Cathedral in English Gothic and Hotel Majestic in Neoclassical and Art Deco. These are just some examples of the British colonial buildings in Malaysia. Post-Merdeka Architecture Leading up to the nation's independence in 1957, discussion on finding architecture that portrayed freedom and the new system of government took place. Modern architecture took shape after the Industrial Revolution and new materials such as reinforced concrete, steel and glass were made available. The early modernist architecture in Malaysia was designed to reflect a new national identity, the spirit of self-governance and the hope of a progressive country. Modern architecture is asymmetrical and rejects embellishment and references to the past. Modern architecture is more practical and efficient, whereas every part of the building has a function. Most buildings are with a lot of sun shading features and using specific material such as concrete. When we gain independence, our architecture also reflected rational thinking and respect towards each other. It is a people's architecture and a symbol that we belong to one nation rather than ethnic groups. A befitting example is the House of Parliament, one of the Malaysia's earliest modernist building. It is a full expression of modern spirit with a form that does not relate literally to any culture or ethnicity but fully responding to the climate requirement and resources of the time. It represents the people, time and place. Other examples of early modernist architecture are Masjid Negara, the old Subang International Airport, and the University of Malaya Tengku Chancellor Hall. Nevertheless, there are also buildings such as the Museum Negara or the National Museum, whose architecture was inspired by Malay royal palaces and vernacular Malay architecture. You get the sense of tradition with the building design but using modern technology and material. The development of the 1960s were very much about unity and creating a national identity for the newly independent nation. But in the 1970s and 80s, building with traditional ethnic or religious influences can be observed. 
Some examples are the Menara Bumi Putra, now it is known as the Bengu Amalat, which interpret traditional architecture with modern building methods. Dai Bumi Complex, which has modern Islamic influences, in the 1980s was another explorative period for national identity influenced by political, economical and Islamic people. I think our architecture today is a true expression of our identity as Malaysian and as a nation. It is a mix of modern, secular and some projects are a balance between culture and modernity. This is the National Library which is designed according the Malay headgear as an inspiration. Similar with all these other buildings with speech roof, it's all reflect, uh, referencing to traditional objects. And in Sarawak, the new Sarawak State Legislative Assembly building has a ninth floor with a height of 114 meters. The cross section of the building is designed like a nine pointed stars. The building is capped with a roof designed similar to a Malaysian royal umbrella. Sitting on top of a hill overlooking Padang Merdeka, a new Sarawak museum designed by architect KDI sit on the site overlooking Padang Merdeka. The new Sarawak museum is conceptualized as an iconic building boasting not only strong visual and aesthetic expression, but also responding to its function, needs as a practical and welcoming public place for all. The design brief dictates that the new museum has to complement the existing Sarawak State Legislative Assembly, which is located in the same actual line across the Sarawak River. Hence, the external facade is consciously designed for architectural dialogue resulting in a perimeter arches crowning the colonnades on the museum's exterior, which resonant with arch ornamented Dewan Undangan Negeri building. The distinctive gold color of the museum roof and facade cladding is also chosen to match the color scheme. And this is examples of other buildings all made reference to the ethnic architecture. And in Sabah, the Sabah's museum main building is designed after a traditional Rungus longhouses. Inside are ethnography, natural history, ceramic, archaeology and history gallery that showcase the rich and diverse culture of history of Sabah. And this 30-story aluminium and glass building, uh, the Yayasan Gab uh, Sabah Foundation, is one of the more extraordinary building in the country. Built with bold architectural and engineering concept, the first of its kind in this region. The building is structured as a 72-sided polygon with walls made of 2,160 special reflective glass panels that can withstand wind speed of up to 272 km an hour. Suspended from the central core of the building are steel radial bracket with some 96 high tensile steel rods uh, are hung and hold the 30th floor of the building. This building is known to be the fourth of such high-rise hanging office building in the world and has been a landmark since its construction in 1975. Mega projects in Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur International Airport is part of the Kelai AR Aeropolis. KLIA main uh, terminal was designed by Japanese architect Kisho Kurukawa with an emphasis of natural lighting within the airport complex. The abstract symbolism uh, by the late Kisho Kurukawa encompassed the Islamic geometry and cutting edge technology with the tropical rainforest in mind. 
The steep elevated undulating roof structure of the KLIA is supposed to imitate the traditional Malay style raised village houses. The underside, the underside of the KLIA dome roof structure is similarly clad in narrow strips of wood, which the architect suggests alludes the vernacular Malaysian timber uh, wood. These are the location of the mega projects starting from Kuala Lumpur to Kuala Lumpur International Airport. And in between these two cities, these two places, we have Cyberjaya and Putrajaya. And this is the Putrajaya master plan. And this is how Cyberjaya looks as of today. Now let us look at the architecture of Kuala Lumpur. The architecture of Kuala Lumpur is a blend of old colonial influences, arts and traditions, Malay Islamic inspiration, modern and postmodern mix. Being a relatively young city, most of Kuala Lumpur colonial buildings were built towards the end of 19th and early 20th century. These buildings have Mughal, Tudor, Neo-Gothic and Grecian Spanish style of architecture. Most of the styling have been modified to cater to use local resources and acclimatize to the local climate, which is hot, humid all year round. Uh, this is the part of panoramic view of Kuala Lumpur in 1884. The settlers were mostly tin miners and it quickly became prosperous due to tin. And as you can see here, the old market square in 1920 and during the Japanese occupation. The architecture of Kuala Lumpur is a blend of old colonial influences, ASEAN traditions, Malay Islamic inspiration, modern and postmodern mix. Buildings with neo Moorish or Mughal style of architecture were built at the turn of the 20th century by the colonial power. While most of the buildings with such architecture are in Dataran Merdeka, there are some in older parts of the town such as the Jamet Mosque in Jalan Tun Pera and the KTM, KTM Railway Station and the KTM Administration Office. All the buildings mentioned before are within the Dataran Merdeka area. All the buildings with Moorish architecture are the Bandaraya Theatre, National Textile Museum, Kuala Lumpur Memorial Library, National History Museum, and the Old Session and Magistrate Court before it was moved to Jalan Duta. The architect responsible for many of these buildings was Arthur Benison Hubak. Mughal or Moorish? This is actually the debate that has been ongoing to describe the architecture of these buildings in Kuala Lumpur. When referring to the architectural style of the historic public buildings along the perimeter of the Independence Square in Kuala Lumpur, some call it Moorish architecture while others label it as Mughal architecture. Moorish architecture is Islamic architecture developed in North Africa and Southwestern Europe, particularly in the Iberian Peninsula from the 8th to 15th century. The most distinctive example of this is the Masquita with its red and white arches. And as you can see, similar red and white arches can be found in many of these buildings that was built around the Independent Square. Mughal architecture is referred to the architecture style during the Mughal Empire that ruled India from 1526 to 1757. The Islamic architectural style adopted for the colonial building in Malaya from the late 19th century was the Mughal revival architectural style movement termed as Indo-Saracenic or called Indo-Gothic or neo Mughal or British Raj with its onion domes, chatris and pinnacles. So this building is located in Fatehpur, 
uh, Fatipur Sikri in India and we can see the similarities of the row of uh, horseshoe arches, onion domes, chatris and pinnacles. Independence coupled with rapid, rapid economic growth from the 70s to the 90s allow buildings with more local and Islamic motif arise in the middle of the city. Many of these buildings derive their design for traditional Malay items such as the headdress and the crest, Malay dagger. This tower, the Maybank Tower, is inspired by the Keris Taming Sari, uh, the Malay dagger. And as you can see, this uh, roof form of the Kuala Lumpur, uh, the KL Centre, the Central Station, is inspired by the Malay traditional roof while the inner domes here was inspired by Islamic patterns. And these hotels and offices are built using uh, traditional roof forms. One of the earliest high rise in Kuala Lumpur is this Menara Dayabumi with its references to Islamic motif. And this Ton Sambantan building designed by Hijaz Kasturi uh, took inspiration from the Gapuram of the Hindu temples because this building belongs to the Indian Hindu party. Kuala Lumpur Central Business District today has shifted around uh, where many new and tall buildings with late modernism and postmodernism architecture fill the skyline. The 452-meter Petronas Twin Tower, designed by Siza Pali and seen from above, resemble the Islamic geometric motif. While looking from street level, the all glass shell of the building give a postmodern take on the more traditional motif. The Kuala Lumpur Convention Center, next door to the tower, this one is Kuala Lumpur Convention Center, uh, shape of an eagle is viewed from above while all the glass shell of the building gives a more postmodern look. Menara Wakaf Bank Islam, this one, designed by RSP Architects and Menara Zakat, uh, designed by Architect FAA, the Islamic Art Museum, designed by Artsa Architect, and Moven Peak Hotel, designed by Hijaz Kasturi, all showcasing the inspiration from Islamic architecture. Late modernist and postmodernist style architecture began to appear in the late 1990s and early 2000. Building with all glass exterior sprung up around the city. As an emerging global city in a newly industrialized economy, the city skyline is expected to experience further changes in decades to come with the construction work of the pavilions, the garden, four season place, Manara Felda of KLCC and many more. Some of this building has been completed. As a developing city and a part of a developing nation, there are many construction projects that are currently being built that will change the city skyline in the future. These are some of the examples of recently completed high rises. Uh, the modern high tech residential here, the John Nouvelles by Jean John Nouvelles, the Capers and Fennel by RNT uh, plus Q Architects. Uh, more building design with sustainability as biggest consideration. Contrast between modern high-rise and traditional low-rise urban village, the new proposal for Kampung Baru uh, and the green facade for a more sustainable design. This will be the future of Kuala Lumpur. There are plans to revitalize Kampung Baru the last enclave in the middle of the city. However, it is uh, facing a lot of issues, 
uh, and a lot of ob objections from the villagers themselves. The recently completed Saloma Link Bridge link this traditional Malay village with its high-rise neighbor KLCC. Uh, now let us look at future of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, some of these buildings are under construction. Some of it has been completed. For example, like this uh, tower, uh, Miti Tower is just uh, completed in 2020. Uh, the proposed Tower M by KPF Associates is under construction. And uh, the other three buildings here also is under construction. The proposed new 700 meter plus tower uh, M started construction in 2019. Uh, just the podium and uh, the underground MRT station. And the MRT station has been open to public in March 2023 this year. Although the construction of the tower is targeted to be completed in the 19, uh, sorry, 2030. Let us have a look at uh, some of the Malaysian architects. Uh, these are examples of the buildings that are designed by the local architects, name, uh, namely architect Hijaz Kasturi, the Telecom Tower, this is a Telecom Tower, and PICC, Putrajaya International Convention Center. Dr. Ken Yang from, with his company, T.R. Hamza and Yang, the Menara Meseniaga, which won the Aga Khan Award way back in uh, 1980s something. Eh? Architect Jimmy Lim, Walian and Ananda House. Architect Kintandu, the Dayabumi. Architect Tan Pei Ying, Marriott Putrajaya, Dr. Tan Lok Moon, the SP Setia Building. This one, SP Setia Building. Architect John Lau K. Siang, the Borneo Convention Center. Architect Haji Esa Haji Muhammad, KL Convention Center, which I shown you earlier. Architect David Mizan Hashim from Veritas, the Menara PKNS, and Dr. Elena Jamil, the Bamboo Playhouse. Renowned architect Hijaz Kasturi is often dubbed the father of Malaysian architecture for his influence on the nation's architecture. He is the pioneer and was extremely influential in the architectural evolution of an independent Malaysia with his passion leading to the construction of some defining buildings over his 50-year career. The famous architect's most iconic architectural achievements are still evident rising above Malaysia's skyline today. Datuk King Tan Lun was a pioneer that revolutionized Malaysian architecture and was a major driver of the transformation of the nature, national urban landscape in the period following the World War II. The Diabumi complex is one of his work. And Dr. Ken Yang is a man with a vision that combines a commitment to stunning architecture with a passion for environment and eco-focused solution. There are many international architects uh, also uh, can be observed in Malaysia. Uh, Kusho Kurokawa designed the Kuala Lumpur International Airport and KL Central Station. Siza Pelli designed the Petronas Twin Tower. Kenzo Tange designed the Shah Alam Civic Center and Menara MBSA and the library. John Nouvel designed the Lunovel. Ryuichi Ashizawa designed this JSC factory and Norman Foster. Foster and Associate in association with the local architects firm GDP Architects designed the Troy car here and also Menara Ilham and the University Technology Petronas. The Troy car development is located near Kuala Lumpur City Centre Park with comprehensive view of the park and the Petronas Twin Tower. The design responds to the unique location with a scheme of three side residential tower, 38, 44 and 50 storey respectively. This will this is the tallest residential development in Malaysia. 
The Ilham Tower development brings together a variety of spaces for living and working in the heart of Kuala Lumpur, all within the compact footprint of 58-storey, 275-metre high tower. The University Petronas, officially opened in 2004, is on a scale of a small consistent with town planning than conventional building. It won the Aga Khan Award in 2007. I would also like to talk about Putrajaya as the future of Malaysia. As I mentioned earlier, there are many buildings designed by foreign architects that become an issue with the local architects who demanded to the then Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad that some project should be given to them. So the answer is Putrajaya. Putrajaya, officially the federal territory of Putrajaya, is the administrative capital and the judicial capital of Malaysia. The seat of federal government of Malaysia was moved in 1999 from Kuala Lumpur to Putrajaya because of overcrowding and congestions in the former, whilst the seat of the judiciary of Malaysia was later moved to Putrajaya in 2003. Kuala Lumpur remained as Malaysia national capital city per constitution and is still the seat of the head of state, which is the Yang Dipertuan Agong, and the National Legislature Parliament Building. The establishment of Putrajaya was the idea of the then Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. The development of Putrajaya began in August 1995 and it was completed at an estimated cost of 8.1 billion. On February 1, February 1st, 2001, Putrajaya became Malaysia's third federal territory after Kuala Lumpur. And Putrajaya is also part of the MSC, Multimedia Super Corridor Malaysia, a special economic zone that covers the Klang Valley. As you can see here, all the buildings in Putrajaya is designed by local architects. The Lot 4G9 Tower is designed by Jamal Marikan Architects. And KPWKM Tower is designed by Hijaz Kasturi. This is Hijaz Kasturi. This is Jamal Marikan Architects. And this is the Steel Mosque, which is also designed by a local architect, GDP Architects, designed the Ministry of Finance in Putrajaya. The Harriet Watt University of Malaysia, designed by Hijaz Kasturi, this one. And the team create a design where the scheme peels open from the ground and reveal hidden treasure in the form of knowledge spaces. Conceptually, by peeling the earth up and creating an earth berm, the campus appear to depict human-scale building plugged into the earth. And this Putrajaya Corporation building, is designed by ZDR Zaini uh, Dubus Riches and cased entirely in an intricately weaving of stainless steel fins inspired by the traditional art of songket weaving. The feature art gui, art archway or gerbang, is a major focal point of the square plaza that marks the intersection of the main uh, road and the Kiblat axis of the core island. Behind the gerbang, the Kiblat axis is framed by the glass enclosed atrium of the twin office blocks. This atrium serves as the public transitional spaces for the council within which meeting rooms are incorporated. The Putrajaya City Hall was awarded the 2006 Schindler's Design Award for Mobility of Building. This is what I mean as the main spine of Putrajaya a 3.5 km long boulevard that connects the Prime Minister's office, this Green Dome building, to this PICC, Putrajaya International Convention Center. And the Kiblat axis is deviated from there and goes to the Steel Mosque.
Putrajaya also is a sustainable city. Uh, this example that I show you is Swasana, designed by T.R. Hamza and Yang, uh, one of more recently completed building in Putrajaya, which has a faceted facade like a jewel. It is used fritted glass panels as part of the double skin instead of sun shades, and the building consumes 30% less energy than a comparative similar building. In April 2007, Putrajaya Holding invited 10 Malaysian architecture firms to participate in the design of a competition for Parcel F of Putrajaya. The competition brief called for architectural design that interpret Islamic architecture in a modern form. So that's how this uh, part of Putrajaya has been uh, designed. Usually most of the part in Putrajaya is via competition like this where local architects are given a chance to submit their design in the competition and whoever won the competition will be able to get the commission for the building. And another example here is the Energy Commission of Malaysian Diamond Building by NR Architects. The building inverted pyramid configuration allow more roof space for solar panels and more ground space for greeneries. The centerpiece of the building is a large central atrium designed to admit and regulate daylight using an automatic roller blind system responsive to the intensity as well as the angle of indirect sunlight. And this is the dome of the steel mosque. Uh, these are some examples of the recently completed project, the Malaysian International Trade and Exhibition Center, MITEC, was designed by Hood Baka, Principal and Director of RSP Architects. MITEC's stately and apolitical design is inspired by the humble rubber seat, which pay tribute to Malaysia's fundamental and age-old rubber industry. In addition to the tribute to the rubber industry, which marked Malaysia's modern economic transformation, the facade of the building also included an impression of local traditional craft. The diamond-like pattern on the facade is derived from the weaving of Songke. It is fused into the design scheme to portray a sense of local identity. MITAC is currently uh, Southeast Asia largest exhibition center. And next to it is the three tower comprising of simplex, duplex suites, service residences uh, of Arte Mon Chiara, developed by Arte Corporation under a joint venture with NASA TTDI. The project was completed in 2020. This is another uh, recently completed uh, project. The tower's flowing form was inspired by the dramatic topography of Penang Island. It was designed by Spark Architects. The geometry and composition of the tower were inspired by the dramatic surrounding land form and immediate between the steeply rising hill of Bukit Gambir and the coastline of the Penang Strait. The geometry of the two towers was generated by the extrusion of an elliptical floor plate, augmented by the addition of a waveform uh, bryosoleil that is subtle, rotated at each floor level to achieve the building's twisted appearance. The taller tower has a sky garden and at 35 uh, incorporate two pebble form recreational residence club. Future of Malaysian Architecture. These are some examples of uh, future proposal. Uh, most of this architecture has an eco-friendly uh, nature and uh, zero carbon footprint.
and some other building here, the Ton Raza Exchange, otherwise known as TRX, a 70-acre development by uh, 1MDB in the heart of Kuala Lumpur International Finance and Business. This project has been completed. Eh? The uh, TRX uh, 11, uh, 106 tower is completed in nine, uh, 2019. And these are some uh, buildings which is uh, currently under construction, which is the PNB 118, while this tree has been completed. The key findings from uh, this show that the debate on the national identity of Malaysia architecture will not be resolved in a single instance. Rather, it will require a gradual development and collective effort to build the national identity in architecture. This statement resonates with the realm of ever-changing architectural approaches within the social-cultural and social-political frame of any given nation. In this regard, the outstanding and rapid development of Malaysia from its independence to contemporary time. As Islam is the official religion in Malaysia, with most Malaysians being Muslim, Islamic architecture should be considered in designing buildings. The architect's vision to apply Islamic philosophy into architecture should be followed. Designers should also cater to human needs to the building in terms of its functionality, and that are meant for people. Architecture is to house the active activities of the society, not only physically, but also psychologically and spiritually. This is the latest Kuala Lumpur skyline, as you can see as per today. This is PNB 118, uh, which is designed by Fender Katsalidas and RS, RSP Architects, uh, will be completed middle of next year. The tower has reached its final height of 678.9 meter, uh, which is currently the second tallest building in the world. As a conclusion, Malaysia is a diverse country that apprehends several styles and culture. Thus, concerning architecture, it is a continuous study from time to time to create a synergy of all the synthesis that represent Malaysia. At least, at the very least, Malaysian do possesses the great potential of gaining its own national identity of architecture. Malaysia portray a unique diversity in so much aspect, cultural, natural diversity and races. This national identity of Malaysia is tough to portray in architecture as there is no significant to represent Malaysia as one nation in terms of the architecture. Architecture is to house the activity of the society, not only physically, but also psychologically and spiritually. With that, I thank you for your time to listen to my lecture and uh, I will open to any questions uh, from uh, every audience here in the comment section and I will try to reply your comment as soon as possible. With that, I would like to thank you and have a nice day.